today and we're going to talk about business to business buyers, B2B buyers and the mandate, a new charter for marketing and sales. Mary, do you want to give a shout out to everyone here? Yeah, absolutely. Hey everyone, it's great to be here. Thanks for joining us today and I'm really excited to uh, share this topic that I think just keeps on giving. Fantastic. And Mary has been a formidable force on the topic of digital transformation, digital selling, social selling, whatever you'd like to call it. She is the go-to person at Forrester that you need to connect with, you need to research and download all of her information. Uh, Mary, you've been shaping the way that we're looking at things, so it's, it's incredible. Uh, maybe you can kick us off a little bit around First, maybe around the why would you like why is sales and marketing alignment so critical, and then why haven't people cracked that code? Yeah, I mean it's a great topic, and as I just mentioned, Jamie, I, I'm kind of thinking of it as the gift that just keeps on giving, and we've been talking about it for years, but I think now there's so much more urgency to get it right, and the reason is because we're seeing so much sophistication in the way buyers are engaging in the process as they as they look to learn about new products and services that they want to bring into their firms. So, you know, what I'm going to share with folks for the next, you know, 20 to 25 minutes is really why it's more critical than ever to get this right. And I'll provide some recommendations for the folks on the line today to take back to their own firms so that they can bring their sales and marketing organizations a little bit closer together. But, you know, as you look at this uh, HBR uh, article, I'm sure everyone's familiar with it. You know, I'm, I've been thinking about this. We're already two decades into the 21st century, and you know, why haven't we cracked this code on the age-old question of marketing and sales alignment? And you know, I've been thinking a lot about why are we still having a conversation? Why haven't we made more progress? And if you think about this article, maybe some of you are business school students or graduates. You know, everyone's read this article, "Ending the War Between Sales and Marketing," and it was written in 2006 by Neil Rackham and a bunch of other colleagues. And we're still dealing with some of the same issues that were raised, you know, over a decade ago. That's, and it's kind of unbelievable when you think about it. But uh, you, you talk about stronger alignment in planning and preparation. Kick us off here in the in the planning stage. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're seeing some really positive um, progress based on research, survey research that we've done, as well as some that some of our clients has done. And we see that the relationships between sales and marketing overall are improving in terms of how marketers and sellers um, refer to those relationships. We're also seeing positive progress with compensation, particularly at the C-suite, where last year we interviewed a bunch of CMOs and they said 82% of them said their comp was aligned to revenue growth and profit. So that's super positive. Now this is a survey we just um, got the data back from a couple of weeks ago. And here we see that marketing and sales alignment is stronger um, in the planning and preparation phases. And I think it's kind of interesting because um, you can see that 76% of the folks said there's a strong relationship when just defining value propositions, when um, about 65% were targeting a segment and accounts and then 62% when defining and executing on field programs. But the challenge with this early stage um, activities and planning, Jamie, is that it's kind of difficult to quantify and difficult to substantiate. So we're back to that situation where um, marketing and sales leaders are saying things are working well, but we don't really have the ability to measure in a hard way. Now has the Correlation between, you mentioned that it's improving, this relationship improving. Is it improving because there's been an awakening of marketing's role in producing um, leads through the demand gen waterfall? Or do you either have either anecdotal or very objective data as to the why it's improving? Well, it's improving, I think, primarily because the buyer is demanding it. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but you're starting to see innovative. Um, organizations have marketing um, involved in, in activities that are deeper into the funnel rather than just sort of transitioning off MQLs. Um, and so there's a sense that marketing needs to be more sales oriented and sales needs to be more marketing oriented. And so we are seeing some innovators really work on getting together and working together closely. So 
I want to move on, Jamie, just to keep things moving here and, and talk about where we're seeing weaker alignment. And, and obviously, there's quite a bit more work to do. You know, we're starting to see weaker alignment in these areas where you actually can see and track results. So reporting of joint activity, not so great. Um, managing customer relationships and references and advocates, we see that salespeople are often very um, ownership focused of their relationships they have. And so um, weak alignment there and sharing knowledge about the customer buying process, again, not so strong. And if you go to the next slide, and, and this is really shocking to me, you know, I see that still 60% of marketers are not involved in pipeline reviews. They're not participating on a regular basis. And um, you see also that 30% say their metrics are not closely aligned with sales. These are really quick, easy fix that any organization could make. If you're a marketer, why aren't you sitting in pipeline reviews and becoming an executive sponsor and helping sales figure out how to advance some of these deals and, and um, putting resources behind them and listening firsthand uh, around what's coming from um, coming from the field. Um, so there's really no excuse not to solve problems like this. They're simple. Now, are you seeing, one of the challenges we're seeing with our customers, especially at the global enterprise level, is that the marketing and sales team, they're not even sitting in the same building or city or sometimes even the same country. Right. So the disconnect is actually geographical. Right. Um, are, are you, now, I, I, whether this is something that you're seeing or not, uh, has has that alignment or the uh, the bringing of alignment actually changed the physical locations of people? Or I just love to know your thoughts on how people are handling that disconnect of of geography. Right, right. It's really interesting. I I have a good friend, Chris Gladwin, um, and he um, has a company here in Chicago called CleverSafe. It just recently got purchased by IBM. And I always bring Chris into my class at Booth to share how he's done an amazing job on the demand gen and with marketing and sales alignment. And of course it starts at the top, Jamie. He simply said, you know, he wouldn't hire a sales leader who wasn't marketing focused, who wasn't willing to work um, closely with marketing and with his company. He insisted that marketing and sellers sit close together so that they're sort of, you know, in the same area. And, um, you know, they go out to lunch, they're friends, and it just, it's a natural evolution. In a digital world, um, you know, with everything that we're doing today, look at, look at the, the meeting that we're having. We have thousands of people who are joining us over the course of the next three days. There's really no excuse um, not for, mark for marketing and sales not to come together. There's all the tools out there to assist. I love it, and that's that was the answer I was hoping you look for is don't use it as a crutch. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, we can move right, right, right on here, um, which is, you know, we talked a lot about the age of the customer at Forrester, and that's a twenty-year business cycle in which the most innovative companies are reinventing themselves to work with and support a more knowledgeable buyer and customer. And the challenge is these buyers aren't interested. They're not interested in how you're organized. There are no more boundaries between digital and human interactions. And, you know, based on mobile channels, um, these buyers have the ability to access pricing information and they can control when, where, and how um, they transact. But if you also take that a step, step further, Jamie, and start to think about, you know, all of us who buy in, in, in the, um, in the, in the digital world, in the B2B world, we're also consumers of products and services. And so, we start to have the same expectations from B2B firms that we do from our, the most trusted brands that we work with, whether it's Amazon, Nike, BMW. So I just put together a couple of analogs here. So you know, we expect our vendors to serve up relevant, personalized, and contextual content, just like we would get on Amazon. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you know, we want to seek feedback from our peers, not just about where we've got to dinner at night, but around the right type of software we might want to bring into our firms. And believe me, um, your customers are going out there and reviewing these sites before they're even interacting with a salesperson. Many of the folks on the line want their replenishment products to show up automatically at their house without having to worry about it. Well, if you're in Madison, Wisconsin, you want the same thing. Um, you've got IoT that connects your tractor to Caterpillar and your stuff automatically um, arrives. And then 
you know, finally this last slide is, I guess it's good for Forrester. Um, you know, we seek trusted experts, whether we're buying a new car or a refrigerator or TV, um, or we want to consult a Forrester Wave to see what type of uh, solution provider we want to bring into our firm. And I'll just say one other thing along these lines, Jamie, is I'm doing a ton of research on um, millennial B2B buyers now, and millennials um, are involved in 73% of the buying decisions for their B2B firms. Sales and marketers are not marketing to them specifically, and these guys really focus on the trusted experts, um, and they don't want to hear sales pitches. They want to hear from Warren Buffett or someone they trust. I, I fully agree. So I as a car nut, read consumer reports all the time. And in fact, I remember my dad used to buy Jeeps and they were always in the 80s and 90s were terribly reviewed in yeah. consumer reports. And I was almost a little embarrassed by the fact that it had have like a half a black star when yeah. all the uh, Toyotas were, you know, four or five red stars. I remember that, yeah. The dad car, the, the Honda, Honda Accord, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I won't spend too much time on this, but this is just to really set some context. And we know what sellers, there's probably a lot of sellers on the phone here, as well as uh, marketing and sales leaders. And, you know, your folks are facing a pretty challenging situation. 92% of B2B um, purchases start with search. 75% of buyers are going to go to social networks and different social channels to learn about vendors. Um, and as you know, you know, executives aren't going to take a call from someone they don't know. So... Again, this is uh, some very, very recent research that's hot off the press. And I asked a question, you know, what are the top three challenges your field sales reps are facing with regard to customer engagement, buyer engagement? And I asked this of sales and marketing leaders. And you can see here that, um, and this is, we've been all hearing this, so this won't be a surprise, multiple uh, stakeholders involved in the decision-making process with different agendas. And as millennials are very, very consensus-driven, Technologies become more and more complicated. You're going to see lots of different buyers involved in the process. I think we're we're seeing even in the early stages six, seven um, typical folks in an early meeting, and that's that's challenging to manage. We're also seeing that the decisions take longer, and I think part of that is because we have more visibility um, in terms of the tools and the marketing automation tools and um, the types of engagements that buyers are doing before they really become um, transactional. Um, and then, you know, there's a variety of other issues here as well. But I think the multiple stakeholders and longer decisions are things that our clients are really um, struggling with and challenged with. Yeah, and for anybody on the call that sells even into the SMB space, this is what we're encountering, Mary, in our own business. So our business, I since day one, we, we manage by committee. We, yep. we are a democratic society here at Sales for Life. But what we're seeing is we had uh, we had served the enterprise mid market, and we continue to do so as our primary objective. But we've started to go downstream. We've started to acquire small to medium businesses as customers. Social selling training curriculum that we sell to you know the oracles of the world. Long of the short is even the small businesses with ten sales professionals. They are now buying by committee. It's yep. not just the VP of sales, but the, the CEO or the finance guy or, oper or or marketing are all getting involved, even at small businesses. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear because usually at SMB, you expect uh, higher velocity or faster velocity transactions. That's really interesting to hear, Jamie. So um, we've got a little bit of a build here, uh, Jamie, so uh, you can move forward as appropriate. But at Forrester, we talk about three macro distinct phases of the buyer journey. And basically, today's B2B buyers want to move through this series of discrete interactions to a relationship with a salesperson. And in this discover, explore phase, they want to take a self-directed approach to acquiring information. So maybe they want to research um, off of their mobile devices, download digital content, access social networks, and so on. But our research shows that um, by a factor of three to one in this discover explore phase, they don't want to hear from a salesperson about product and service. So if you want to insert yourself into this early phase, which is really important as you want to shape a buying decision, you've got to have personalized and contextual engagement. Um, so that's really, really important. As you move to the next stage, the buy use uh, phases, they uh, engage in ongoing education. And so they want to deepen their understanding of both the business problem as well as the vendor landscape that's out there. And during these phases, they want much more discrete interactions with both sales and marketing. Maybe they 
attend a, vend a, a vendor event or an industry event, or they want to bring a salesperson on site for a large stakeholder meeting. Um, and then finally, in this ask engage phase, they want highly personalized engagement. And um, you know you can see that engagement through ABM account-based marketing programs, where you know you're taking a very very personalized approach to engaging with them. But both the seller and the buyer want to extend the impact of the relationship in this phase. And so what we're seeing and hearing is that a number of customers really expect and want to do innovation and co-creation as they look at customizing the product and service even a little bit more for their unique circumstance. So um, some research that I did this summer with, um, with a customer uh, really um, unveiled some interesting things that buyers want from the reps. And what we found was they want a um, dynamic, data-driven, and insightful conversation. So they are more likely to purchase from a sales rep who is going to weave um, data and insights into discussion, who's going to share with them something new that they didn't know, someone who can measurably talk about how their product or service is going to impact uh, business performance. And I think this last one is most important. They want a rep who can flip on the fly to talk about what matters to them rather than taking them through some sort of linear sales oriented presentation. And so, you know, all of this is within your seller's control if you provide them with the right level of support and they're more likely to win deals if they can approach it this way. I This is amazing, Mary. I fully agree with it. I think you know, in our in our service-based business, we are constantly having to debunk myths, so overcome uh, misconceptions. And the teaching something new is actually, I just think of it as painting opportunity cost. You know, just you're showing them the decisions of less foregone. But then in the second piece where you've got the suitcase with the arrows, yeah. the and services, and, and you then roadmap uh, a, a, a story that says, you know, Forrester's data is showing you this, and let me actually show you examples, uh, and then being able to walk them from an uh, from a uh, whether it's a solution set or an activity or something that actually aligns to an objective that they're trying to achieve or a result that they're trying to achieve. So at the beginning of the call, you're collecting, you know, what are your goals? What are your the results you want to achieve? And if you can tie the two together, uh, it's like it's the light bulbs going off in people's heads, right? You you teach them something new and you showed them how what you do aligns to the actual objective that they set at the beginning of the call, light bulbs. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it is a challenging situation out there, but all of these four things are within the control of your go-to-market organization. If you can do this, the likelihood of, of your organization winning relative to another vendor is much higher and our data shows that. So what I'm finding more and more, and probably Jamie, you, you can concur as well, is that today's buyers don't want to be sold to. I heard um, from someone I was doing some research with that they don't want to be sold to, they want their seller to let them buy. Um, and so we find that they want to engage in this um, uh, with both digital and human assets across this holistic but nonlinear journey. And they want basically either a frictionless exchange or a high value interaction. And they don't really want anything in between. And so I call that the, the two star, five star experience. You know, when I'm out, um, I, I'll only stay at a five star or two star because anything in between kind of is disappointing. Um, and so I think buyers are really heading in that direction. They want tremendous value or they want to be able to transact in a frictionless way and they don't want to mess around. Yeah, the way I've always seen it is I'm going to inform I'm going to arm you with information so that you can make an informed decision. And if I arm you with enough information to make that informed decision, I'm hoping that we align to what you're trying to achieve. But I'm just going to facilitate your uh, th that journey that you're on and it's really up to you at the end. I just hope that I've painted you the roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. So as we talk about you know, some of the changes with, with sellers, um, I think this is a really interesting quote. And Meredith Bell from Azalead is uh, president of their America's business. And he said to me, you know, in the past, uh, it was the product that was the star, right? It was the people who would go in and wow um, prospects and customers with an amazing product demo. He said, now it's the sellers that need to be the stars. And they need to learn some of the skills that market 
marketers have, whether that's getting access to insights, more personalized interactions, um, cutting data, um, you know, a variety of different ways where you're really going in as sort of that consultative business partner um, to add value in the conversation. Yeah, and I, and, and I assume that you're, overall this becomes a transformation of the sales professional themselves in thinking of this is not a job, but this is about, a, in a way, a lifestyle or a career in which you are going to consume so much of your world and bring everything you've got to that customer rather than what I see with sales professionals is just like doing the same old tricks over and over and over again, over and over and over again. They get really good at those tricks, but the, the buyer is just like, that, that's not what I need. Right? Yeah. I, I want you to talk about what I care about. Yeah. So, We've kind of talked about this in some of the other presentations, but uh, Andy Hoare, who's my colleague, wrote a very provocatively titled report called The Death of B2B Salesmen. And so, you know, I'm sort of spending a lot of time thinking, you know, is the B2B salesperson dead, alive, in need of some sort of a reboot? And clearly, um, I think the, the B2B salesperson who goes uh, by rote and pitches product and service is in need of a very significant reboot. And so, you know, I spent a lot of my time really helping organizations understand how to how to adapt their selling organizations. So at Forrester, we have uh, four different types of selling archetypes, and many companies may have their own versions. We find in the B two B world, there's typically you know four types of sellers: the explainers, who are um, the product demo folks; the order takers, who um, are high velocity transactional sales reps; they deliver value by um, quick turnarounds and create urgency by um, discounting. Navigators are those folks that, um, you know, have rich relationships across a variety of different business units and can tin cup and put ROI studies together. Well, the consultants, you know, I think is going to be the highest echelon of salesperson today and in the future. They are the folks that completely embed themselves into your business. And one thing I will say about this framework is I'm not saying that everybody has to be a consultant. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not likely that organizations can afford that or that it even makes sense. But the key thing here, if you look at the axes, is you want to look at the complexity of the product and service that you're presenting, the complexity of the buyer dynamic, and make sure you align the right types of sellers to the right stack of customers and prospects. So it may be perfectly appropriate to have an explainer or order taker, um, but you need to put them in the right uh, patch of business. But also keep in mind that, you know, as digital technologies continue to mature, the explainers and the order takers are going to increasingly be either replaced or amplified with technology. Uh, and I'm glad you said that that last line, because that's the important piece. I, I envision like, there's going to be a culling of yeah. the of the sales organization because I, I look at our, our global enterprise customers, they're actually asked to trim headcount yet increase the yield or throughput per sales professional every single year. Why is that? Because technology and efficiency is allowing the sales professional to go from a million dollar quota to a million and a half to Absolutely. two million. And so the adding of headcount, which in certain countries becomes even more onerous because of the mental and and, um, and all the benefits, it is cheaper to increase the yield per sales professional than it is to add headcount. Absolutely, absolutely. And CFOs and CEOs are now onto it, um, particularly with the maturation of all these different technologies. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on the traits of the consultant, but you can see it's very different from the salespeople that we've hired in the past. They need to be very technology savvy, um, particularly if they're using social, they're tracking um, data around buyer behavioral data. They're using stuff you know, that can help them have more contextualized and personalized discussions. But you can see that these qualities are really different from what many organizations have hired in terms of salespeople over the last you know, five to 10 years. Yep, and, and long and the short, Mary, I once told you the story that I was called uh, a demo doer by a previous <laughs> and I lost my marbles. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. I was the best demo doer in the company. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've evolved, so I'm 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 glad that that's behind you. 
Um, so, you know, as we think about this new charter, it's really a, a charter that's now being driven not by the CEO, but by the buyer. And that's why I think finally this marketing and sales alignment concept is going to finally stick. That basically, you know, marketers who are siloed and salespeople who are siloed will not survive with this increasingly independent, knowledgeable and sophisticated buyer. So the smart organizations, Jamie, are already realizing that and coming together. Um, but I think this is now a buyer-driven edict rather than a CEO-driven mandate. So for the purposes of the, you can move forward, Jamie, onto the, onto the next one. So for the purposes of this discussion, what, what I'm recommending um, folks do is to, to, to make this marketing and sales alignment conversation less theoretical, less academic, and pick one or two or three initiatives that you can use that are going to be buyer-centric, but that are also going to be driving marketing and sales together. And so I really think about the three initiatives as personalization, social selling, and account-based marketing. And here are looking at uh, some of the personalization things. You know, buyers are expecting you to know about them before you do outreach. And as I was talking to Aaron, who's the CEO of Charlie App, maybe some of the um, folks on the line here use that. It automates the research process so that sellers have in their CRM system um, customized details about the account or um, contacts that they're calling into, and they don't have to go to four different sites to find that information. But what Aaron said was in the last, you know, last years it was about volume, the volume of activities and quantitative metrics. Now what sellers are fighting for is something that, that he coined as attention currency. How much attention is my message going to buy? And I thought that was just a really great way of thinking where we are today. Huh. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't even comment because I'm, I'm absorbing and. <laughs> <laughs> so some, some of you folks actually may use Crystal Nose, and I was on uh, the line with uh, my research associate Jake Millinder and Jill Rowley, who many of you know, and Jill was telling us about Crystal Nose, and Crystal can actually go out and. Um, you know, scrape uh, a variety of different um, social data and serve it up in a personalized, emotionally aware and contextual messaging. So while we were on the line, we actually did, did my personality profile. Um, and I'm only sharing the good stuff here. You guys can go search out all the um, you know, sort of words that I've got as well. But it was like literally, Jamie, 99.9% .9 right. And we, we really just dropped the mic when we saw it. And so, um, you know, Crystal Nose is, again, something you can overlay on some of your social activities, integrate it with CRM so that you are having um, messaging that is either visually or um, textually relevant to the way your contact wants to acquire information. This is incredible. Now, is this a free application or is this a paid application? Well, it is a paid application. I think there's some elements of it that's freemium. So we went on and for a few days I had access to my personality. So I would encourage folks to, you know, Go take a look. It's 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 really eerie, eerie how accurate it is. Yeah, I, I want to check this out. I was once told in a meeting. I think the person said, "You're a hard D." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you and I may have some things in common, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, another company I think is really cool is um, uh, VivaStream, and they're an events company, and they actually capture all kinds of data from large events that folks go to and, um, you know, what types of tweets uh, attendees send, what sessions they go to, what types of blog posts they go to, um, and they then take that data, overlay it onto your marketing data within your CRM, and then pop out some really cool visualizations for your sellers. And then these sellers go back and actually um, have conversations with their senior level stakeholders to tell them you know, what members of their organization are, are worrying about, what they care about, what they want to learn about. And so this is this concept of customers now want um, to have a dialogue with you, but they don't want to sit down and spend an hour to map out what they're worrying about. They want you to come to the table knowing that, and the tools are out there to enable you to do that. And what is this application called again? It's called VivaStream. VivaStream. One of the top lines that you have here, content consumption patterns. I. I personally think is one of the most important elements to sales and marketing alignment. And if you overlay all marketing data touch points or you know, all the, the fingerprints that a buyer leaves on your digital assets and you interlace that over top of sales interactions, calls, emails, demos, proposals, contract negotiations, 
and you put it on a timeline, and you then do it at scale over a variety of customers, you start to create prescriptive trends. You could see what you should be building, what you should be sharing with customers at what times. Uh, so that I didn't realize that there's now technology because you know, for us, we've been we we pull you know pull our HubSpot and our CRM, our Salesforce together, and we kind of mash it together. But if this can help automate it, that's incredible. Yeah, there's just, I mean, every day I'm taking more and more briefings around um, different capabilities, and so it's super exciting for the seller. I actually think it's never been a more exciting time to be in marketing and sales if you're open to this kind of uh, change and you're intellectually curious and technology savvy. Fantastic. So now I'm going to, uh, you know, sort of this other initiative that I think is a great way to bring marketing and sales together, which is social selling, and Jamie knows I'm super passionate about it. And I think one of the things that's, uh, really interesting to me based on the survey that we just did a couple of weeks ago is we found out that only 31% of uh, the folks that we interviewed, sales and um, marketing leaders at large companies and, and mid-market companies, have actually rolled out a formal social selling program. And yet... And were there specific industries that you concentrate on or was that kind of... It was across... Uh, the country. Yeah. Now, you know, from my own uh, work with customers, we know that the technology providers are, are, are pretty strong, particularly the top tier in the services companies and companies with large distributed workforces. But this was across a variety of, um, of industries. And so I think this is a tremendous opportunity, you know, obviously for Sales for Life to provide um, some help and coaching um, as these organizations really start to figure out how do they leverage this vibrant social channels because if you think about email and phone and even to a degree face to face those are pretty fatigued channels but the social channels are pretty vibrant and so we're seeing here from marketers now um, looking in the early phases of, of the marketing process of the customer um, life cycle that um, they're calling social as one of their top three most effective demand gen tactics um, and if you go to the next slide Jamie you can see that um, now we're getting data that show that social sellers um, outperform their peers. So 70% of folks who integrate social into their daily cadence are um, outperforming their peers. And so that means they're hitting their quotas and others aren't. So I think, yeah, we I think that this is really going to be a ubiquitous marketing and sales distribution channel and relationship building extension channel. Yeah, we talked about the importance of increasing throughput or yield per sales professional. If your organization is not adding headcount, you need an extra 5 to 10 to 20 percent out of every seller. We had a customer that actually had a, almost nearly 100 sales professionals, and so it was a perfect AB test. So they split the company in half, AB. One, one half became social selling enabled over a six-month period, and the other status quo. At the next year's, the 2016 sales kickoff, the social sellers had outperformed the non-social sellers by 157%, and nine of their 10 largest transactions at the sales kickoff that were presented on the, on the big screen were socially sell selling influenced or attributed or, e or originally sourced. And I think that's an important piece for everybody to understand. It doesn't mean every deal was originally found because of social. It is part of the influence and attribution of the deal, intermixed with all the other disposal or your tool belt, such as phone, e shows, but they just applied it as right. part of their teams. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it you know it's it's fantastic. I'm so bullish um, on the channels, and and obviously you're not going to close a deal on Twitter any more than you're actually going to close a deal on the 18th hole. Um, but there's so many opportunities throughout the entire life cycle, and one of the ones I think that's not talked about enough is really the ability to do research and listening, um, so that you can again go back and be very consultative in the conversation. So um, I think it's a it's really interesting, and what phenomenal results, Jamie. Fantastic. And, and so this is just, you know, for the marketers who are joining us here today, you know, social sellers are just like your customers. and There's not a one size fits all. You know, not everyone needs to go out there and be the celebrity like Jamie or myself or Jill Rowley or Greg Terrio or whoever they are. Um, but you need to understand um, the different types of sellers that you have in your organization and support them appropriately. And so what we find is that most of the folks who are really focused on B2B selling fall into the social novice and expert 
area. And um, the social novices tend to be more experienced sellers, so they understand the art of the deal, they're good closers, um, they understand the finer points, and the experts tend to be some of the millennials that may be slightly earlier in their career technology savvy, but don't have the finesse in terms of the um, in-person interactions and so on. So I think it's an interesting dynamic and an opportunity to partner up those types of sellers together. And then I'll, I'll say with the non-participants, you know, if you're in a very um, legacy industry where it doesn't make sense, fine. Um, and, but other than that, I would say don't participate at your own peril because um, this is where the world is going. A hundred percent. My first sales job, I, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to use a computer at my desk. It was a phone and a pencil and a sheet of paper calling down a list. Yeah. Now, I, oh, within only a few years later, would not exist or wouldn't even be possible to exist. We needed Google, right? And yeah. so the same thing's going to happen. The same thing's going to happen. Absolutely. And so just as we move on to the, the third um, potential initiative for you to think about to bring marketing and sales together, it's account-based marketing. And um, I don't want to go into too, too much detail here, but as you think about account selection in the past, you know, sales would sort of scribble down on a piece of paper or send an email to marketing and say, these are the five accounts I want to have, you know, lots of events around and specialized uh, marketing campaigns and allocate your resources to. And then maybe they they find out that their kid plays soccer with uh, the CEO of another company that's not on that target list and then say swap a company out and add something in. Well, today, you know, you're seeing a maturation of very sophisticated scientific tools that can help with targeting um, and selection and even, you know, predict when a firm is more likely to make a purchase. So selecting accounts now has to be something that's really a joint activity that looks at um, quantitative and qualitative methodologies and brings marketing and sales together. And you pick that a list of accounts and you stick with it. Um, and you build some milestones out over the next, you know, 12 to 18 to 24 months. It's not a quick turn. You know, uh, we talked to someone at SAP who said, I'm not really interested in the four or five million uptick on a quarterly basis. I'm looking at the 50 million we're going to get from this account over the course of two years. Yeah, and this is a, a critical piece to the account selection. I, I see customers that will build their account list based on potential wallet share. So they'll go on Google and say, what are the top 20 yeah. accounts in the XYZ market? I encourage them to intermix that with strategic accounts, and we, what we call around the sphere of influence. So they're within a degree of separation of a customer story. They, right. they had past employees that have migrated to that company, current employees that you know, vendors or partners. Basically, you're using, that, you're using the social reach or social proximity from right. one customer to the next to also penetrate those particular accounts. And it's a, and it's a delicate balance because if you just went on Google and you're only focused on the ones with the largest wallet share, but you have zero social proximity into that account, the velocity and the time it's going to take to win that account is so long, you could have got some really ripe accounts based on your own customer database. Yeah, absolutely great. And you know, if anyone on the call is a Forrester client, I encourage you to read my report called um, Account-Based Marketing Brings Marketing and Sales into the Same Orbit. And there's a framework at the end of that account which looks at new ways to select and segment accounts. And you need a methodology um, that looks at relationship density and um, interaction and engagement and not just necessarily pick the biggest brand. You know, you could have um, a big technology company that spends seven million a year with Forrester, right? But maybe it's only going to grow two to three percent every single year um, because of the way they've negotiated the deal. Or it's, it's a company like Kraft where there's very strong procurement. But other companies might have much stronger engagement across multiple channels. They might make a better target account. So I completely agree with you, Jamie. It's uh, new methodologies in terms of the account selection process. Fantastic. And then um, I won't spend too much here, but what, you know, kind of one of my my pet peeves around rolling out social programs and also with ABM is that you know everyone says, oh yeah, we have social. We have a couple of licenses to LinkedIn Navigator, and a couple of people are really visible out there. But is it an initiative? Do you have training? Do you have executive sponsor? Do you have systematic compensation and milestones that are measuring progress? Are you meeting regularly to uh, realign? 
and look at um, your constructs to make sure they make sense. Um, maybe if you've got an account where there's a tremendous amount of growth, you should even align a marketer um, with that account. I interviewed EMC and they actually have marketers that sit in the deal teams and get compensated on um, account growth um, and other types of metrics over time. So we need to see the compensation in marketing get more aligned with sales, not just at the C-suite, but down the chain and start to do some new things organizationally to um, encourage that tighter uh, connectivity. Yeah, the mission that a lot of customers have wanted to have with us because our own team, our own marketing team, and we're smaller business, is measured on a portion of sales bookings that are driven either, either as an original source or can be directly linked to uh, influence and attribution. There's a portion of our total revenue mix that has to be driven for marketing. And the compensation piece is important because you have to think about the weight uh, at the sales professional level. If I had a choice between going after an inbound lead or digging hard for an account selected uh, lead where I need to go outbound, uh, compensation drives behavior and you know that the sales professional is going to migrate to the path of least resistance and go after the inbound. So how are you going to keep them on course to that two-year plan that you just described, trying to win that Johnson & Johnson account, which you know is going to be right. a different comp model? Or they'd say to themselves, what's in it for me? Why would I do it? Right? Yeah. Fantastic. So Mary, we're, we're gunning uh, to the, I got the knock on the door here. So. Um, where do you want to take it here to wrap everything up? Yeah, this is really just the wrap, which is, um, you know, today's buyers de demand a higher level of cl collaboration coordination between teams. And the biggest thing I want to leave the audience with is a status quo approach to going market doesn't work. So you've got to start embracing new constructs, methods, tactics, and let go of that sil siloed approach. And, you know, I won't go into all the, the details here, but it's really about putting the buyer and the customer at the center of everything that you do and personalizing and engaging with them in a way that makes sense for them while shaping um, a shared vision for how you can work together over the entire life cycle. Fantastic. Mary, I, I greatly appreciate your time. You, you are truly shaping the way that our industry is looking at digitizing. I think that's the, you know, I call it a digital transformation, but moving from analog to digital, basically. Uh, Mary, what the best way to get a hold of you is through Twitter? Or is there any other means of communication if people want to pick your brain? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter all the time. I am also very available on LinkedIn. And my Forrester email is simply mshea at forrester.com. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of the folks on the line here are Forrester clients. So, um, you know, easy access to me through your account manager. Um, and if you're not, I'm always happy to send on a report or, or anything that might be helpful just to, uh, um, you know, be uh, digitally friendly to anyone on the line here. Fantastic. Thank you again, Mary. And looking forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.